Yeah. So good evening, everybody. Buenas noches. Um, if you can hear, please put an affirmative in the chat. Are we getting our affirmatives? Okay. Okay, good. Um, now, how about now? Because we put the mic, can people still hear? Okay, good. So uh, welcome to Mexico in the defense of national sovereignty. Our, pre our presenter today is Jose Luis Granados Ceja. And, um, but uh, uh, Arnoldo um, Borja, who is an activist here in DC is going to give be the, the uh, what do you call it, the MC? And he's going, so he's going to the moderator. And so he's gonna do a brief introduction, but, uh, but to introduce Arnoldo, he is uh, an, uh, an activist with Mexicans without frontiers, without borders, Mexicanos sin fronteras. And I am Julie Barnett, Juliana Barnett, and I am with the Mexico Solidarity Project. So now, uh, I'll turn it over to Arnoldo. Hi, good evening. Uh, it's a pleasure, it's un placer for me to present my good friend. <laughs> Paisano. <laughs> Paisano. <laughs> Jose Luis Granados. And here in Washington, D.C., the capital of this country. Very interesting geographic geographical point and and used to talk about sovereignty and hablar de soberanía uh, with all the experience con toda la experiencia que mi compatriota that my conational bring to us into the public so we are going to be very careful when we are listening then Jose Luis because his the struggle is all over Latin America. So all, all over these places where this soberanía has to be defended. So very welcome, Paisano. Un placer. Un placer. Gracias. Y bienvenido. Muchas gracias. Me siento muy bien recibido. I feel very welcome here. So, yes, and so we are going to open with uh, with a song, uh, this is a corrido mexicano about a, a, a leader uh, of the struggle in Mexico. And uh, so we're going to present that to you right now. You can yell loud, uh, como one Mexicans, like a good Mexicans. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you can also relax. Tomes tu venganza, 
yo ha batido a balazo, es el líder campesino. En el palacio central se burlaba el asesino. Usaba su paliacate como Gabino Barrera. Quería como zapata para los pobres la tierra. Tres jinetes en el cielo cabalgan con mucho brillo y esos tres jinetes son Ramona Zapata y Caramillo Como él estaba durmiendo no se pudo Gracias. Thank you. So, uh, we are ready to hear the experiences that our friend Jose Luis is bringing to us. All right. Thank you so much for that amazing introduction. That's actually the first event we've had with a little bit of a cultural element and it always kind of, you know, livens up the room and, and makes us feel like we're amongst family and friends here. So thank you so much. So I'm here to talk about the fourth transformation of Mexico. I'm here to talk about the defense of national sovereignty. And in a sense, we can say that this tour is about the defense of national sovereignty. So that's the name of the title. Next, please. And I'm particularly excited about the presentation this afternoon, this evening, because here, I think we're amongst comrades. Aquí estamos entre camaradas. And so, you know, I've been making presentations to student groups, to trade unionists and their allies, yes. But I think here, I'm gonna let myself go a little bit and speak a little bit more from the heart. I think when we think, talk about Mexico, just I was speaking with a brother just outside the door. Unfortunately, it seems we don't know a lot about the political project that's happening, despite the fact that Mexico is neighbor with the United States. But I think that's deliberate. I think there's a reason why you're not hearing about Mexico. It's because it's an inspirational story. And I'm here to share that with you and I hopefully inspire you, but also invite you to help us defend our sovereignty. Because I think it's important for the struggles that are about to come before us. But when we think about the project of Lopez Obrador, when we think about Morena, what it represents, I think in a lot of ways, it's summed up by this quote from the president who says, we must show that modernity can be forged from below without excluding anyone and that development does not have to be contrary to social justice. These are terms that perhaps maybe fill out of fashion a little bit, modernity, development, social justice, but in some ways represents that rescue of ideas that are useful for, for political struggle, but also open the path to a further deepening of political transformations. Next, please. 
Oops. No, <laughs> uh, so what do I mean by the fourth transformation? This is a term that Lopez Obrador coined, President Lopez Obrador, uh, in a way of trying to tie what's happening in Mexico with historical processes, to say that it belongs to something broader, grander than just what's happening in this moment. So for those who are not familiar, the first transformation in Mexico is the political independence struggle, breaking free of the yoke of Spanish colonialism and establishing an independent country, which was not an easy process. There was a second, which was the reform period, the reform led by Benito Juarez, the struggle against foreign interference, the struggle against the occupation by French powers. There's a third transformation, which is the Mexican revolution, which was the struggle against the dictatorship of Porfirio Diaz, the struggle by the campesinos for land and freedom, for control over their own territories and their destinies. And that brings us to today, the fourth transformation. It's a peaceful transformation. And I think that's something that often is emphasized by the president, this idea that we belong to other to this, this historical moment, but this rises to the level. And in fact, sometimes they criticize the president for that, for, for trying to say as it is, it rises to that level. But I think over time, we have seen that that is the case. That is true. We are before a moment where there is a transformation of the country. So for the Mexico Solidarity Project 2018, the election of Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador was a watershed moment. And often what I say is it wasn't just a change of government, but a change of regime. No fue un cambio de gobierno, sino un cambio de régimen. What do I mean by that? Well, the process for the struggle of democratization of Mexico is one that can go back to 2006, to the year 2000, to 1988, and even further to 1968, which is to say, this is a very long process to, that got us to this point. So when we think about why it's a watershed moment, uh, as I mentioned, 1968, the student movement, students taking to the streets, working, good, we got it working, struggling to put a, shine a light on the situation in the country, the pre-dictatorship, when the Olympics were gonna happen. Now that, mo that movement was powerful, was well-organized, it was disciplined. And precisely because of that, the response by the state was to militarily defeat it. And it was a big setback, but kind of, Glossing over a little bit of the history, we can say we move on into 1988. And there's Cuauhtémoc Cárdenas, the son of Mexican President Lázaro Cárdenas, who breaks from the PRI and tries to run for office, running on a program of rescuing what the Mexican Revolution represented. And in that year, they commit a fraud, quite literally, for the famous Se Cayó el Sistema, where the votes were being tabulated. It looked like Cárdenas was going to win. Suddenly the machine breaks down, all the, they stop counting. And when they turn it back on, what happens? Suddenly Salinas de Gortari is the winner of the election and he consolidates that fraud. And so that was a lost moment in that democratization struggle. And then moving forward again, 2000, which was a period that finally, it seemed like there was at least going to be a change in government and Vicente Fox wins. And a lot of people felt, okay, this is democratization. If you read articles, they'll talk about this is the moment that Mexican democracy, modern Mexican democracy was born. And yet Vicente Fox ends up perpetuating the same system and actually helping to consolidate the neoliberal regime in the country. And then 2006, Lopez Obrador runs for the first time. Similarly, there's electoral fraud. Then 2012, again, the establishment uses all of the resources at its disposal, practically buying the election and denying us that opportunity. But then comes 2018. And in 2018, we see the election of Lopez Obrador and not just by a small margin. He wins with, near, with over 52% of the vote, beating the next rival by 30%, delivering a powerful mandate. And I think that's why we can say that this is a moment where 
the situation for the country has changed. So you can see, I have that quote there from an article by Edwin Ackerman, where he says, the parties that had dominated the political field throughout the neoliberal period were suddenly reduced to rubble. And it's not an exaggeration. That's the modern political map in the country. You can see the color guinda, the color of the party, that is now expanded throughout the country. 22 of 32 federal entities, which is to say the state and Mexico City, the capital, are now governed by Morena. And these election victories have come little by little throughout the years, which is to say often governments get elected and they start to lose popularity or they start to have to tack to the center to try to win. In Mexico, Morena continues to consolidate its political dominance in the country and continues to receive widespread support from the population. You know, we th we'd look at other experiences in Latin America and yes, they're successful in one moment, but then they suffer defeats. I think in a lot of ways, the process in Mexico has been one of perpetual progress, of continuous progress, of consolidation, of strength. And we'll get into why I think that is the case later on in the presentation. But you can see that there is widespread support in the country. The map says it all. Next, please. Oh, it's still giving us trouble? Oh, that's too bad. OK. Um, so Morena is a dominant political party in the country. And that presents to us a very difficult situation in the sense that when there are reduced spaces of operation for the party, for, uh, for the opposition, they start to seek different means of influencing the public debate. They start to find less democratic means of expressing themselves. So I guess because I, I have it planned with the, with the presentation, so I'm losing track of myself. There we go. Okay. Okay. Uh, so when we talk about Mexico's fourth transformation, when we talk about this project, how can we sum it up? What, why can we say that this is a left project? Okay. So it's an anti-neoliberal nationalist development strategy. What do I mean by that? Sort of some of the pillars of neoliberalism have been eradicated. So this is a very different kind of approach to the organization of an economy. There is a deliberate effort to redistribute wealth to the population, redistribute the wealth of the country and its resources directly to the people via the state. That's one of the sort of classic examples of what it means to defend a left project, to reduce inequality, to redistribute wealth. There's been a massive expansion of cash transfer programs. So the most popular one, one you might be familiar with, is the pension for seniors. So the way I always kind of characterize this is that if you've ever been to Mexico or if you've lived in Mexico and you go to a grocery store, there are seniors who are at the checkouts who bag your groceries for tips. And a lot of that emerged as a result of the neoliberal period where there wasn't support for senior citizens and they were forced to find ways of surviving and that was one of them. While you still see it, some of them say they do it because of the socializing, it's less necessary now because of this pension that they receive from the state. It's universal. It's one of the emphasis of the of Morena's political program. Gone are the days of you know uh, kind of targeted specific social programs and a move to what used to be one of the standard causes of the left, which is universal social programs. Even the rich, if they want, they can collect their pension because it's a constitutional right today. And so these direct cash flow programs, for example, for the seniors, it means that they can spend, uh, they have money to buy their medicines. They can go out once a month, once a week with their family to dinner instead of having to eat at home because that's the only way they can afford to eat. There's other efforts uh, like the scholarships for students. I myself am a student. Uh, I don't pay tuition fees. I was presenting with some students and they got a little bit jealous when I told them I don't pay tuition fees. Not only that though, the state provides me with 14,000 pesos a month so that I can focus full time on my studies. Yeah, just go back one. Um, but don't tell the state that I'm here using my scholarship to talk about the politics. Anyway, the level of reach of these programs, that's just a, a selection of them. There's a lot more, but it's to the point where 70 
percent, 71% of Mexican households, that is to say, at least one member of a household receives one of the social programs, is involved in one of these universal programs that tells you just how much the social welfare state has expanded in Mexico. The minimum wage has increased in real terms by 90%. There's also, and I think it's always important to mention this, the rescue of the state oil company, Pemex, the rescue of the national electricity company, Comisión Federal de Electricidad, which were very important in terms of the economic development in the country historically. But in the neoliberal period, they tried to basically marginalize these companies. A lot of the refineries were literally turning to rust as part of an effort to privatize, to say, we need that foreign capital. We need that private capital to save these companies. But Lopez Obrador said, no, we're going, the state's going to invest in this. We're going to rescue this. They bought a refinery here in the United States, Deer Park. They built a new one. The idea is betting on these companies, state owned, to drive forward economic development. And again, provide those resources that we need to redistribute to the people through social programs. And then finally, this image here, poverty reduction. I always like to emphasize this. I think a lot of people here in this room you know, are committed to transforming their country, transforming the world. And a lot of that has to actually turn into material results for people. This is one of the clearest examples of why I personally believe that it's important to engage in struggles for political power because it allows us to accomplish things like this. For the first time in a long time, we're reducing poverty and inequality in Mexico. From 2018 to today, there are now nearly 9 million less Mexicans living in poverty. 9 million, Mexico is a big country, but 9 million is the size of some countries. We're talking about lifting a lot of people out of poverty. We obviously have a long way to go, but it shows the effectiveness of this. You know, sometimes we had to kind of speak about what was happening in Mexico in abstract terms, like I did at the beginning about, you know, nationalist development strategy. But now we're more than five years into his mandate. The results are evident. And I think that's a point of pride. It shows that it's worth the effort. It's about delivering those material benefits. So that's just an image of some of the social programs that are available. I put that up there just to show you the wide array. You can, uh, we can revisit that one later, but from building hospitals to improving the refinery, opening new universities, uh, the programs that I mentioned for seniors, programs for campesinos, so that they can stay in their communities and work the land, et cetera, et cetera. It's a very long list. Even things like uh, the Secretary for Territorial Development, Sedatu, which was what often used in the, in the old regime, in the neoliberal regime, as a petty cash box. It was where there was just rampant corruption. You know, they would build a market, they would, and, and they would charge double what it was actually worth to, to build. But now, actually, they're building beautiful public spaces that they, which is also for me one of the projects to achieve justice, right? Just because we're not wealthy doesn't mean we don't deserve nice spaces. And that's actually one of the things that's happening. And that's just an example. Next, please. So I mentioned this, you know, in during the neoliberal period, the government, the institutions of the state, some of them which were actually designed explicitly to address some of the issues, were distorted, manipulated. They became mechanisms for the accumulation of wealth of the wealthy. And so gone are those days. Now there is a very substantial effort to tackle corruption, to actually use these institutions for the good of the population. There's a saying that the president likes to use a lot, which is por el bien de todos, primero los pobres. And I think it really kind of captured it. In English, it's for the good of everybody, but the poor comes first. That's right, yeah, applause, great, great comments. Here. So go back, hold on. I'll tell you what, what is so Mexico's opposition, which is made up the PRI, the PAN, the PRD, and Movimiento Ciudadano is also in, in opposition, but they're kind of pursuing a third way. Those three first parties, which were historically rivals, always competed against each other. They're definitely not really friends, but they've been forced in what we can call a forced marriage. They are lost in the political wilderness. They have not known how to respond to the political reality of the country today. As we saw at the beginning with the map of Mexico, Morena has become a dominant force and they're kind of lost. In some ways, I think they think what happened in 2018 and what's happened since is an aberration and things will go back to normal eventually. We just got to keep at it. But it's not true. 
people are starting to realize what it means to have a qualitatively different government, a government that is actually focused on the needs of the working class, of the campesinos, of the informal sector, of the students, some of the middle class. They are starting to notice this and they're starting to incorporate it into their own analysis. And so that leads them to uh, once again, understand who is actually acting in their interests. And the opposition doesn't know how to respond to that. They think that things will go back to normal and they'll be able to return to power. And so they find themselves compelled to mobilize in the streets. And I make a point of that because, you know, I said that they don't have sort of the political capital anymore. They don't count on support, but they still have to try to find a way to be influential. And so they try to latch on to issues and try to, you know, uh, arroparse, try to wear causes that are not exactly tied to the opposition. I would say chances are, if you heard about something happening in Mexico this year, it was probably this talk about Mexico's democratic decline, that they that the president was trying to dismantle the country's democracy because he was pursuing a reform of the National Electoral Institute, which is Mexico's electoral authority. And so the opposition saw that this was an issue that resonated with their base, but also with sectors of the middle class, and they started mobilizing around it. And I always make a point of emphasis because there's some people in Morena that kind of downplay this, but it was, you know, successful for them. They were able to mobilize the population in support of the defense of the INE. It became their rallying cry. And so if the opposition finds itself compelled to try to mobilize. Next, please. And like I say here in this slide, this is one of the hypotheses that I think one of the key things that I want people to take away, which is unable to assert political power, they're forced to find influence by other means. And so they do that by working in uh, working to mobilize around the so-called defense of the INE. And in November of last year, they held a successful demonstration. They were able to mobilize a lot of people on the streets. Uh, they, they calculate that on their, during their first mobilization, they had probably around 100, 200,000 people on the streets. That's a lot. I mean, if you were able to get 100,000 people on the streets of Washington, D.C., it'd be on the front page of everything. And that's fine. I think that's part of democracy. You know, maybe they don't get a lot of votes anymore, but they're able to get people onto the streets for this issue. But this is a room of leftists. Am I right? And the streets belong to the left. So if they're going to mobilize, then we have to as well. And the president called for a demonstration of his supporters to show that the left is the one that owns the streets. And they mobilized and they had a demonstration as well. And in the pro-government demonstration, there were a million people on the streets, a million. And I'm not exaggerating, that sounds like an unbelievable figure, but it happened in Mexico City. I made a point of being there. I wanted to be there. And it's true. So for those of you who are familiar with Mexico City, it's Paseo de la Reforma, right? The big avenue in the heart of the city. So that's the opposition demonstration. You can see a picture of it. Let's go to the next one. Uh, actually, we'll skip this. Um, go to the next one. Next one. So we can see a million people on the streets lining along Paseo de la Reforma. And actually... Lopez Obrador says, I'm going to march with the people. And at the starting point, starts walking. It took him almost five hours to make it from El Angel to El Angel de la Independencia to the Zócalo because there were so many people. He was moving at a snail's pace because everybody wanted to be able to have that moment with the president and wave to him and show their support. I emphasize that because it, I think sometimes when we talk about Mexico, we only see it as something that's happening from above. If, you know, if we hear about anything at all, that the president with his press conference every day that he holds, Las Mañaneras. But this is a process that is involving the masses in a direct way and mobilizing them and showing their capacity to mobilize and showing. So when the opposition does their rallies, that there is that answer. Let's go to the next picture. This is one of the iconic images that I love to stay on. 
It's taken by Luis Antonio Rojas. It's always important to give him credit. Yeah. It's absolutely incredible. The, they, they love this picture so much that it's actually, it's been uh, put up. Every, it should be a t-shirt. It's up in the National Palace in many of the offices now. It's just, it's incredible. But the word I've been using when I present it is like, it's almost biblical, you know? Like at the light shining on the president, the outstretched arms. It's, it's, it's an incredible image and it captures that. It gives you a sense of the love the commitment, but it's not empty. It's because when you talk to people, they're like, this is the best president we've had in the last 50 years. It's that real sense that something important is happening in the country. There's a couple more images we can move. You can see this is, this is one I took from the streets. You can see how full the streets are. It's a very wide avenue and it's totally full. And so going back to this narrative that I'm telling about, I call it the, the Demos and counter demos, or marchas y contra marchas. So this whole kind of mobilization happened around this defense of the National Electoral Institute and the reply by the government. Ultimately, the constitutional reform that Lopez Obrador wanted to pursue to change the Electoral Institute, they didn't secure the two-thirds supermajority to get it. To do that, you have to negotiate with the opposition, and they weren't interested for whatever their own reasons. We don't need to get into that. But the president and the party come up with what's called the Plan B. The Plan B was uh, something that was also seeking to reform things, important things like facilitating voting abroad so that, and also addressing what we call the gilded bureaucracy. One of the slogans of the president that he used on the campaign trail and he continues to use now in office is, no puede haber gobierno rico con pueblo pobre. You can't have a rich government and a poor people. And so when you have these bloated institutions that are, you know, they had some of the, the people who work for the Electoral Institute have drivers, they have chefs, they have a budget for seven advisors each, right? Just an excess. It's not so much about the savings that you get, but it's important symbolically that we not have these kinds of guilty bureaucracies. Well, so they pursue this kind of reform. And the opposition, again, seeing that they were able to mobilize, seeing that they had actually gained some political capital by attaching themselves to this issue, they call for another demonstration. And similarly, you know, they are successful. They filled the Zocalo. People who know Mexico City, Zocalo is a very big square. And they say that if you really pack it tight, you get somewhere between 100 and 200,000 people, maybe more. Uh, you know, we had Silvio Rodriguez play a concert there, and there was about 100,000 people there. Just gives you an idea. And so similarly, the government says, okay, that's fine. We're going to mobilize our supporters. And the mobilization for the pro-government supporters happened on March 18th. 2023. March 18th is a very important date for Mexicans and particularly for those on the left. It's when we celebrate the expropriation of the oil industry by Lázaro Cárdenas in 1938. And so this was the anniversary and he ties his political project to this historical moment, but also the defense of sovereignty. So we can see some images from that demonstration as well. If we go to the next one, is it frozen? There we go. That's a photo from La Plancha del Zócalo. You can see it was full. And yeah, he filled the Zócalo and then some because there, El Zócalo no era suficiente. It wasn't enough. The, side, the streets on the side were also packed with supporters. And again, when it comes to the battle of the streets, the left won. And I think that's important. Next, please. So like I said, on the anniversary, the theme of the rally was the defense of national sovereignty, a turnout, a little bit less than the first one, but still a lot half a million people. And like I said, there was a deliberate effort to tie in much of what Morena does, but in this particular moment, to historical moments of political struggle in the country and victories for the people. So if we go to the next slide, I'd like to pause on this one always, because you can see the president in the middle, 2022, the nationalization of lithium, right? And to the president's left, 1960, the nationalization of the country's electricity industry. To the president's right, Lázaro Cárdenas, the expropriation of the oil industry. So you can see how these concepts are tied in together. There's a deliberate effort to, pe to make people understand that this is a continuity of a historical project. So we go to the next one. This is a quote that I, uh, from an interview that I did with one of the members of Morena's Political Training Institute. And I think he hits the nail on the head. We in Morena feel that we are the heirs of those struggles. Our heritage is the fight for social rights, for political rights, that is why we connect ourselves to those old struggles. Although they are from the past, they're still very present because even today it's still necessary to defend everything that Cárdenas fought for, 
what Lopez Mateos fought for, what Pancho Villa and Emiliano Zapata fought for, and so many other popular leaders. So you can see that, that connection. Next, please. Now, so you see these mobilizations. It's a battle for the streets. And I mentioned that the opposition tries to find different ways. One of them was trying to latch on to this cause of the defense of the INE. But as I say here, despite the fact that they held two successful rallies, it's not likely that this is going to turn into political victories at the ballot box for them. And so what do they do? They try to continue to have influence. And how do they do it? Through the courts. You can see that first headline there, the way that they tried to freeze the efforts to reform the Electoral Institute via the courts, via the, the, the Mexican Amparo, which is basically um, almost like a, an injunction, state institutions like the Electoral Institute, the free trade agreement, going and speaking and asking the United States and Canada to petition the government to reverse some of its policies or direct interference by, direct interference by imperialism. And I think it's really important to talk about it. We should name things what they are. Imperialism is, I would argue, the major threat to political transformations in Latin America. We should be anti-imperialists on that basis. And it's not enough to say no to interventionism. It's useful, but we should go beyond. We should name things where they are because if we understand the phenomena, then we're able to resist it. So go to the next one, please. For example, why do we see this happening? And I think this is an interesting way of viewing it. AMLO's policies, this is a class struggle. This is national liberation, the dialectic with imperialism, right? There are interests, foreign capital interests that are salivating at the notion of being able to continue to exploit the country's resources. Uh, what's the word in English, saquear? Pillage. pillage, to pillage the country's resources as they had been doing during the neoliberal period. And so they do things like go and talk to Biden and ask him to give him an ultimatum to say, do this or else, right? As they've done with so many other political processes in Latin America. And it's funny, if you read that last line, it says, United States and Canada accuse Lopez Obrador of favoring Mexico's state-owned utility over power plants built by foreign and private investors, something that is forbidden by the country's trade pact. They similarly talk about the oil industry. Oh, the free trade agreement doesn't let them do that. Let's go to the next slide. That's a lie. It's not true. There is actually, so when Lopez Obrador wins, it was actually in the midst of the renegotiation of NAFTA, USMCA, and he's able to send some of his negotiators. And that negotiator is able to include a very important phrase, replacing a previous one. Lopez Obrador says it himself at that demonstration on March 18th. It fills me with pride to be able to recall today, March 18th, that despite the policy of granting concessions that prevailed before we came into office, we were able to remove a long chapter from the free trade agreement that compromised our oil and put its place a small paragraph, which I'm going to read to you, which is this. The United States and Canada recognize that Mexico reserves its sovereign right to reform its constitution and domestic legislation. And Mexico has direct inalienable and imprescriptible ownership of all hydrocarbons in the subsoil of the national territory. That is the defense of national sovereignty to put it even into these free trade agreements, which are basically designed with a neoliberal ideology in mind. It shows the reach that it can get. So when you read stories like this, remember, they'll never tell you that this kind of thing is actually in the dream. Next, please. Now, I like to also emphasize some of what we've seen, what I call the manufacturing of consent that is attempting to be done in this country. There's this article that was written by Valerie Wershafter and Arturo Suraca on March 16, 2023. Arturo actually served as ambassador during the, the old regime. He's often quoted in articles as if he's some kind of impartial uh, commentator on Mexican politics. He has political interests, although he'll deny it. But anyway, he says this, the last thing that AMLO wants to do at the swearing in ceremony of Mexico's next president is place the presidential sash over the shoulders and opposition president elect, and in doing so, jeopardize the legacy of his so-called fourth transformation and the survival of his pet projects and policies. Now you read something like that, and it kind of sounds like, well, Morena doesn't really have a shot, they're going to have to cheat at the elections. There's going to, there's probably going to be some kind of malfeasance. They're trying to sow this idea that the project, that Mexico's fourth transformation isn't incredibly popular, 
that 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 Marena is actually well poised to win the next election, that what Lopez Obrador is doing are just pet policies and projects when it's actually a very clearly ideologically defined project. And so it's important to remember that. I put there below, it's a classic strategy. I work as a writer for Venezuela Analysis, and I've seen the way that they use this kind of rhetoric to undermine leftist, progressives, socialist governments in the region, trying to label them as a threat to democracy, as rising authoritarianism, which is what the name of that article was. And it's worrisome because in a worst case scenario, they could try to do the same thing. In fact, very recently, there's talk about applying sanctions to Mexico for selling oil to Cuba. And I'll, I, I, what, it's not in this presentation, but I'll share with you a little bit later. That is national sovereignty. Mexico has the right to sell oil to Cuba if it wants. They don't need to ask permission for anybody. And so this is what they do. They try to sanction us to undermine our process, to weaken us, to cause harm to the economy, et cetera, et cetera, because their ends are the same to pursue the interests of the ruling class, to pursue the interests of their capitalists and their countries who want to continue to pillage the country. So next. And then we're also seeing the emergence of this, which is also tied into this same regime change strategy. Threats of invasion, threats of a unilateral military action by the United States in Mexico without Mexico's authorization. Now, I always like to remind people, this idea first started to be known to the public when Mark Esper, one of Trump's cabinet members, wrote a book. And in that memoir, he writes about the time that Trump was like, can't we just bomb the cartels and the labs? They won't even know it was us. Do you remember that? A ridiculous idea. And it was treated as ridiculous in the press. Everyone, even Esper said he wasn't sure if he was joking. And yet... Now you see people like William Barr and Mike Pompeo and all of the Republican presidential candidates talking about it as if it's a reasonable policy. There's now a majority of people in the United States, and there's very specific reasons why, who now agree with this as a potential policy option. A strong majority of Republicans think that it should be something that the president, if he's elected, and likely the case that it'll be Trump as the Republican candidate, should do within the first days in office. And that's actually what the think tank that's tied to Trump has actually proposed. Now, I'm going to take a little bit aside and talk about why that I think that's happening. So if we all remember, Trump started his campaign in 2016 by attacking Mexico and Mexicans. And it was useful. That, not so much of a dog whistle, but a shout of racism, mobilized that xenophobic racist element that does exist in this country, particularly in the Republican Party. It was that base that saw Trump as their champion and a lot of ways carried him into the candidacy and into the presidency. But that idea only has so much currency. Eventually you get to the point where it's not as effective to mobilize. Now there's a very real opioid crisis in this country. We know it. And by saying that Mexico is responsible for the country, for this, this opioid crisis, it makes it more real. It makes it something more tangible. So they say, you know, it's the Mexicans fault that your neighbor, that your brother, your cousin, your sister, whoever it is that's dealing with addiction or may, has, may have died as a result of misuse of opioids. It's their fault. And so people feel motivated. In fact, in some of the other presentations, I talked to people who said, yeah, all of my friends, they're they're scared, they don't know what to do when it comes to this crisis. And that seems like a reasonable thing. And so it's a very effective tool. It transforms this kind of imagined threat into a very real threat. And so that's why we're seeing it and it's working really well, but it's tied to this regime change strategy. Next please. This is actually a quote from an article by Jeet here in The Nation, which I think spells it out a lot better than I can. When he says, according to David Frum, writing in The Atlantic, liberal democracy in Mexico is under assault. Given Frum's famous contribution that George W. Bush is speechwriter to use the use of pro-democracy rhetoric to justify invading other countries, his intervention is suspect. At the very least, Frum's thinking suggests the worrying possibility of an alliance between uber reactionaries like Marjorie Taylor Greene and the more polished establishment voices of the foreign policy elite in a shared project of regime change in Mexico. So when you hear this kind of rhetoric, that's what's actually at play. It's not about the drugs. The only reason that the fentanyl and their precursors are coming through Mexico is because in 2019, the U.S. agreed with China that China would control its export. But as long as that demand continues to exist, 
organized crime, both in Mexico and the United States, because a lot of people pretend like it only exists in Mexico. How do people think drugs get into people's hands? As long as that demand exists, they will find a way to make it get here. And it just so happens that Mexico shares a border with the United States. And so it goes through Mexico. And so that's why you see so much insistence on this, but it's not Mexico's fault. It's just being used, it's being weaponized to pursue these regime change interests. They're scared about the consolidation of Morena, about the fourth transformation of Mexico, and possibly, hopefully, a deepening, a radicalization of that process. Next, please. So this is an amazing clip that I love to share with audiences. This is from the March 18th rally. This is Lopez Obrador speaking to the audience, speaking about these threats, speaking about the attempts to affect the country's national sovereignty. And you will see why I mean, this isn't just a project that's coming from above. This is a project that is also mobilizing, engaging the population, the citizenry, the masses. So let's watch the video. Hopefully we get the fix because it's worth to see the end. There we go. Listen to the crowd. So I think that really captures it. I've seen that video maybe 30 times and it still gets me riled up. Imagine, imagine, right? And so you see the call and the response that the crowd isn't, I was in the crowd, right? I was with chanting with everybody. It was overwhelming, but it also speaks to what the project is about. So, and when he talks about sovereignty, you know, he talks about the dignity of our homeland, but it's also really key because it's not just about defending Mexico. It's about what that gives you. I'm going to mention, I mentioned this briefly, uh, I think two or three days ago, I kind of lost track of time. I don't even know what day it is anymore. But um, so like I mentioned, they're talking about trying to sanction Mexico for selling oil to Cuba. So when he says we have the sovereign right to do, we have sovereignty, it means to be able to do that, to say we have the right to sell our oil to Cuba if we want. And we don't have to ask anybody permission. And he says that explicitly so, right? He talks about Cuba is a dignified people who are under an un a legal and unjust blockade, right? So it's not just about sovereignty strictly in the national sense, but about the concept and that the masses understand that concept and they employ that concept. Again, that it's about people saying, I will defend sovereignty as well. And so that's really important. Anyway, on the, on, I want to, uh, we'll go to the next slide if we can. I want to conclude with talking about where things stand moving forward. So in Mexico, the constitution doesn't allow for re-election. López Obrador has a single six-year term and that's it. Although he always jokes that he served a 12-year term because he works twice as hard as any other president. And so he's able to do more. And the truth is he does. I don't know if you realize this, but he holds a press conference every day, Monday to Friday two hours, three hours long every day. And then on the weekend, 
he goes to a state and holds a rally. So he never stops working. And then sometimes he'll, he like recently published a couple of books while in office. I don't know how he, like, he must never sleep. And he's an older guy. He's got some health issues, but he's there. He understands that this, you know, you only have one shot. So we, there is no um, re-election. So now the country's thinking about its successor. Um, we can skip this because I moved on. Next. Uh, I have a friend who does a lot of political work in Canada. We're friends from university. And I was talking, I basically gave an informal version of this speech to her. And she was really impressed. And I was telling her, she's like, yep, the political, economic, media establishment, it's all, it's all totally against us. You turn on the news. Oh, I gave this story earlier. There was, uh, in Mexico, there are free textbooks for every student from, from, K to, from kindergarten into high school, provided by the state, public and private schools. And so they come from the state. And so the, the, the ministry or the secretary of education is the one that designs it. When the newest version came out right before the school year started, there was this fear mongering campaign about the threat of communist textbooks and how it was going to undermine and indoctrinate our, our children's education, blah, blah, blah. And it was a deliberate campaign, particularly in one of the private media outlets, TV Azteca. And TV Azteca is owned by one of the oligarchs, Ricardo Salinas Pliego, who is really upset with the government because the government dared to make them pay taxes. That's it. That's what the real base issue is about. In fact, one of the criticisms from the left is that Mexico hasn't done enough to raise taxes on people like him and his companies. What Mexico has done is actually collect because in the previous neoliberal regime, they would forgive all the back taxes that they had never paid on the, the guise of protecting jobs. And under Lopez Obrador, they're collecting. They're like, no, this is what you owe. You better pay up. And they'll fight in the courts. But this whole rhetoric is trying to undermine the government. So you have the whole establishment against it. And when my friend asked me, well, then how do you do it? By turning to the masses, by flexing your capacity to mobilize, by having an educated population, by deliberately engaging in political education with the party members, with people who sympathize with the common public. If you watch a Mañanera, the, the morning press conference, there's always almost like an, almost always an element where he talks a little bit about history and a little bit about the, you know, why, why he takes a position or who is this person? He's, he's a, he's a bright guy and he knows a lot. So this conscientization, this consciousness raising that's continual. And so quoting again, the, the guy that I interviewed uh, from the uh, education issue, he says this, I think it's very important. The opposition knows that there is a population here who's defending a national project that is popular, that is from the left, that is progressive and is trying to do what's best for everyone. In fact, I was talking here with the brother. He's like, I don't know anything about the left in Mexico. It's a popular left progressive happening in, in just south of the border. And then Lopez Obrador in that rally says, I'm convinced that we will continue to receive the sort of the people and consolidate my emphasis, the first stage of the transformation. All of us knew that sympathized with the left, that sympathized with Morena, that it wasn't going to get done in six years as, try, as much as he works hard. It's going to take several six years, we call them, several six year terms. And so there's the next one. We're now pretty much in the election period. Let's go to the next slide. So I talked about how the media establishment is kind of against and how they're trying to craft a narrative. The opposition has chosen its candidate and it's very kind of particular about who it's chosen because it's trying to bet on fooling the masses and they're constructing this narrative. And I think this video really captures the way that they're doing it. And I'll explain afterwards just how wrong they are. Go ahead. She's been a shot in the arm for a moribund Mexican opposition. A politician who seemed to come from nowhere to secure the candidacy of a coalition of parties for the country's presidential elections. She's Sochitu Galvez, a plain-speaking, part-indigenous senator who started off as a street vendor and now runs two tech companies who bikes to work and wears traditional whipils. In short, she's got the popular touch, and that's exactly what many say a jaded, corruption-sullied opposition needed. 
Your servant doesn't come from privilege. She comes from selling jellies, and she knows what it means to struggle to get ahead in this city. Your servant knows more than the candidates for the governing party about this country, its guts, its poverty, its neglect. Galvez is currently a senator for the PAN, a conservative party, but she's also got unconservative views on things like gay rights, abortion and the environment. And a sense of humour too. It's her in the dinosaur suit, in the Mexican Senate, protesting against an election reform she said was outdated. All that's made her a threat to the country's leftist president, who's attacked her repeatedly in his morning press conferences, even putting information about her company's contracts on the big screen. She is the candidate of the conservative potentates, the corrupt, those who looted Mexico. De los corruptos, pues. He can't run against her in the next election, which is happening next June. Mexican presidents only serve one term, but his successor can, whoever wins the Morena party primary this Thursday. That's the test. After a muddled process which saw her chosen for the opposition without even a final planned vote, Galvez now needs to take on the strength and organization of Morena. It holds the majority in Congress, the Senate, and most of the governorships of Mexico states. And Morena has at least two high-profile, competent candidates waiting for their shot at the presidency. But before, it seemed the governing party was destined to win. Now at least, there's a credible challenger. John Holman, Al Jazeera, Mexico City. So let's pause there. Make sure to subscribe. So he says, now it looked like it was a sure shot. Now there's a credible challenge. The president feels threatened by this. This is all what we call in Mexico, el fenomeno Xochitl, the, the Xochitl phenomenon. Trying to sell us this idea that this conservative senator who wears a weepy and bikes to work has the popular touch, that she's going to be able to reach all of the supporters that usually vote for Morena, right? Because she's different, right? She, she has that popular touch. It's not true. None of that is true. As I just finished telling you, this is a conscious population. This is a population that is aware of what it means to have this new type of government in power that says no to the old neoliberal regime. A conservative that we build is still a conservative and the population knows it. They're not going to be fooled so easily just because they're trying to sell this narrative. That video might as well have been made by her campaign because you can see behind me, those are the polls. Those are the latest ones that I, that came out on this one. And I checked the methodology, you know, because sometimes they can be skewed. These were 2,000 visits to home, which is to say they're not phone call polls. They're more reliable. 64% of people indicated they would vote for Claudia Scheinbaum, the candidate of Morena, to 17% for Xochitl Galvez. The other poll, similar, a little bit closer, 50 to 20%. So it shows you that this so-called Xochitl phenomenon, that the president feels threatened by her, it's all a narrative. And that narrative is serving a very specific agenda, which is to say they're trying to sow this idea that the next election won't be legitimate, that when Claudia Scheinbaum wins, which she likely will, it won't be because the population wanted her to win. In fact, Morena, is so confident about where things are headed in the country that it's not aiming for just a majority in the Congress. It's actually trying to win a supermajority so that it can make constitutional reforms and deepen the process and engage in more of the kinds of reforms that go against the interests of the political and economic elites in the country, against the interests of foreign capital, because that gives them the political tools to do so. We'll see what actually happens. They may or may not get it. But the truth is, there's a good chance it could happen. And that's what the president calls the plan C. Now the battle is to get the conservatives out of their strongholds. With a supermajority, you can reform the judicial branch of government. You can clean up these so-called autonomous institutions in the country where the elites have taken refuge. And I think one of the reasons I'm here with you here today in this in, in this country doing the speaking tour is we're going to need your help. Because, as I said, one of the major threats is imperialism. And so when that result happens, let's say they're doing a supermajority, I guarantee 
that there will be efforts to try to undermine that. We're already seeing signs of that being their strategy. Felipe Calderón, who won in the fraudulent election in 2006, is already giving talks inside of these, you know, right-wing think tanks and intellectual groups saying, you have to push for the United States to monitor the elections, right? They're going to come monitor the elections and maybe they'll come out and say that it weren't free and fair or that uh, state resources were used to help Morena win. And then they're going to try to apply sanctions and they're trying to do what they did to Venezuela because they know that when they don't have the support of the population, they have to do it these other ways. And so what does that mean? That means Join the Mexico Solidarity Project Bulletin. You can hit the next slide. I actually made this QR code. We can scan it afterwards. Sign up for a newsletter. It comes out every week uh, in English and in Spanish. We make a mission to make sure that it's accessible to also Spanish speakers translating everything. Please join because that's where we're going to send out information. We're always trying to counter that narrative. A lot of, like you saw in the news clip that I showed, the coverage of Mexico is wrong. And it's not like they're deliberately trying to fool the population. I think people like John Holman, I know him, he's not a bad guy, but he's talking to the same old voices that we've heard from for decades, right? Often, if you look up an article, you'll see, chances are, Jorge Gastañeda is going to be quoted in it, or somebody like Carlos Bravo Regidor. These people have a political stake in making Morena and the government look bad. They're not impartial observers, but they reproduce this idea. That, uh, that news clip that you saw came out the way it did because they don't have an ear to the ground. And so in the Mexico Solidarity Project, what we're trying to do is give that counter narrative, get that other perspective so that people can be informed, share it with your friends and neighbors, talk with the Mexican-American population. We're going to try to see if we can do another tour and bring some resources, figure out how to get more, more Mexicans that live abroad to vote. But also, I want to invite you to come down to Mexico. It's not that far. It's pretty, you know, it's, it, you know, I get it. Not everybody can afford it, but it's certainly cheaper to fly to Mexico than somewhere like Brazil or Venezuela or Peru, right? Come down. We want to organize a delegation. We want to organize election observation mission. And yeah, the government's going to do its work to, you know, diplomacy and its own observation and all that kind of stuff. But I think it's important that we build people to people solidarity. It's one of the key lessons that we've learned from the experience with Venezuela. When we have people championing the cause, in their own communities, with their friends and neighbors, with their families that can speak to it directly. Can, if a terrible article comes out in the newspaper after the elections, you can be like, actually, I was there. And let me tell you, the population does support this. And this is why I've seen the transformation. I've seen the difference in people's lives. And I don't agree with this narrative that you're trying to sell. It's going to be an important struggle. And also, Hopefully, as we consolidate, as we advance, it inspires other people. Some people say that we're in the midst of a second pink wave in Latin America. What well, we can say, the first one started with Hugo Chavez in 1999. The second one started with Lopez Obrador in 2018. As we advance globally as a working class struggle, we advance for the working class as a whole. And so also, again, thinking about the daunting task in this country, I'm you know, I lived in this country. I'm familiar with the politics, but I'm not from here. I don't, I'm not a citizen. I can't vote here. It's not my place to tell you what to do. I, in the same way that I wouldn't want you to come to Mexico and tell us all, we're, all the things that we're doing wrong, because there is some things that need to be improved. But if we were able to dismantle the neoliberal regime, the two party system in Mexico, you can do it here. It's perfectly possible. Yes, it's hard. But if it, it was just as hard in Mexico, and not only were we able to do it, but we're consolidating, we're advancing. With Claudia Scheinbaum, and I'll close with this comment. You know, as Morena was deciding who was going to be its candidate, there was kind of an evaluation. Where's the party at? Where's the country at? And the things are going so well that we can actually choose the representative that best represents our political project. You know, we think, think about Ecuador. In Ecuador, where I lived there a number of years, the party there, that the leftist party of Rafael Correa, because he couldn't run again, chose Lenin Moreno, former vice president, thinking that he would keep it forward. But it was a tactical move to the right to try to win back some sectors. Things are going well in Mexico. You don't have to make that calculation. So they've paced their bets on Claudia Scheinbaum, who represents, in a lot of ways, the left position inside the party. She represents the left flank inside the party, which means, I'm, you know, I, I highlighted that the first stage. Well, here comes the second stage. She often talks about 
el segundo piso de la transformación, the second floor of the transformation, deepening, going further, building on the gains. So now we have, you know, these state-owned institutions that can help create all of those social programs, expand on them, increase the amount of money that is making it to, into people's pockets. That's what is at stake here. And I think that's really exciting. That's where we can get when it comes to Mexico, because the project is on really strong ground. And that's really exciting. You know, a lot of you may have not heard a lot of the things that I talked about tonight, you know, but it's a, there's a reason for that because it can serve as an inspiration. You know, there is, it is possible to make a better world. Mexico's proof. Thank you, Jose Luis. Uh, after this perspective about the biggest threat comes from the imperialism. So, and we are here in Washington, D.C. In the belly of the beast. That's right. So, and Compañero AMLO having asking the Biden president to stop giving aid through the USA through the, these people who is against AMLO government. And it's a lot, a lot going on. And a couple of demands to this country about to stop the selling of weapons to narcos in Mexico too. So thank you very much. So now, if you have questions, please, here is Jose Luis to answer these questions. Thanks so much. This is really, this is really interesting. Um, my, I guess my question might be a little bit. Can people little, say their names when oh, they speak? Uh, my name is Greg Wilker. Um, I, uh, my question might be a little bit uh, kind of uh, I don't know, coming out of nowhere, but not really. I, you know, we work together. Yep. <laughs> um, you're working on Venezuela analysis now as well. And so, of course, I studied Venezuela for a long time. And uh, so I'm kind of, when you were talking about uh, AMLO, I was wondering, well, what are the differences and similarities to Chavez? Uh, because I haven't really experienced AMLO at all, whereas I did experience Chavez quite, quite a close. And so I'm kind of curious to hear what you think might be the similarities and the differences, because they seem to be very similar in some ways. Absolutely. And I'm wondering, you know, how you compare the two. Yeah, I think the the first thing that comes to mind when we think about what they might have in common would be that they both represented kind of this counter hegemonic, this outside of the establishment political project, right? Somebody that represented a threat to the established order that existed in the case of Mexico with the PRIAN, the neoliberal regime, or in the case of Venezuela, This, who was able to really compel the masses to participate in the project to actually dismantle it, right? To say that, you know, it's one thing, they're both charismatic figures that have a lot of popularity. And I think that is important. You know, we shouldn't down, um, you know, downplay it. But uh, both were able to channel that enthusiasm of wanting some to do things differently and being able to deliver that change using the state you know, making a bet. I think I was talking about this earlier. A lot of the, the left in the United States seems to mostly have an association with the extra parliamentary left in Mexico, right? Uh, but there is a left that believes in taking state power. And I think a lot of what Chavez showed us is that it's also worth it. It's about taking all of this wealth that does exist in these countries and putting it into the hands of the people of creating a welfare state. I also think that uh, in a sense, uh, that confidence in the masses is what they have in common of saying, I'm willing to go further because I know that the, that the population is behind me. You know, uh, you know, when, when Chavez was first elected, he often talked about the third way and all this stuff. But when he saw the, uh, the enthusiasm, the defense, they literally rescued him, uh, you know, during the 2002 coup, he felt that he understood that the, the, that the people were with him and allowed him to radicalize. I think uh, in some ways they would be different in the sense that uh, the threats of imperialism against Venezuela came much faster 
much more direct, the support for the U.S. coup, the support for the oil lockout, and that served to radicalize the process. You know, there's this concept that sometimes gives the whip of the counter-revolution, right, that kind of forces you to be a little bit better. In a way, I think the situation in Mexico has been a little bit too easy. You know, there's it, like we just saw they keep winning elections. It hasn't actually been all that difficult, which makes them get a little bit overconfident or also not willing to ask the hard questions to expose those contradictions. But they're coming. We know they are. Right. Uh, it won't be long before they start trying to apply tariffs against Mexico for protecting its domestic energy interests, for protecting its oil interests and all of that. And so it's going to force probably not Lopez Obrador, but Claudia Scheinbaum to have to face this off. If there's an, if they really are serious about this and the Republicans win and they actually do this, and I do think that if they do win, they're going to follow through on this, you know, that's going to force the leadership of the country to ask those hard questions and hopefully give the right answers. Uh, you know, we talked a lot tonight about the defense of national sovereignty. And I was at, a, at an event uh, earlier today at the University of Maryland and I was talking with uh, with the dean of the school there, and I mentioned, you know, sometimes we'll read articles here in the United States from think tanks. Um, the one guy that comes to mind is a guy named Ryan Berg. Some of you might know him, and he writes about sovereignty hawks in Mexico. What is a sovereignty hawk? That sovereignty is not negotiable. That if, if if there's such a thing as sovereignty hawks, we're all sovereignty hawks. We will all defend that. That's what it's actually about, and so. If the United States leadership decides to pursue this really dangerous idea, they're going to run up with a population, a government, a party that considers sovereignty a red line. There will be no negotiation. They, you know, read some of what the Republicans who are advocating these proposals have to say. And they'll say things like, well, we were, you know, chances are we won't have to do it. We'll just pressure them. And they'll, and they'll concede. When, when they know that we're serious about using unilateral action, they'll concede. No, they won't. That will not happen. And it's going to present a very difficult situation for the population. And I think that will hopefully also serve to radicalize it. And hopefully that the leadership will go the way that Chavez did, as opposed to conceding of actually radicalizing. That's my hope anyway. Okay, thank you, <laughs> Great presentation. Um, you mentioned during the presentation that while AMLO has made progress in various social programs for the Mexican public during his presidency, he's not necessarily in control of every component and every branch of Mexican government. So, hold on. And so my question is, does that include the military? Because there are a lot of Central Americans here and the militarization of the Mexico-Guatemala border has been a, to a great detriment to Central Americans trying to go, go to the US. So my question for you here is, to what degree of responsibility, if any, should we give AMLO with regards to the militarization of the Mexico-Guatemala border? And if, there, and if he has no control over the Mexican military down there, then, the question then is, is that really a Mexican military or a military at the service of US economic foreign aid? Yeah, I'm really glad you made that question. I will say, I'll start by, by, by responding with the following. Um, so the Mexico Solidarity Project, even though we're sympathetic, uh, you know, we're not Morena, you know, we and we keep that independence precisely to point out the things that we disagree with. And I will say in front of everybody, and I'll say it to anybody in Morena, if I had the chance, I'd say it to the president. Uh, the policy around migration is wrong and needs to be changed. We, have, we owe a debt to our, our Central American brothers and sisters, the migrants, because what Mexico has done is, yes, it's basically they made a trade. So when Trump threatened to impose really punishing tariffs on Mexico in exchange uh, what the, for not doing it, what they did was ask Mexico to do precisely as you described, to play a very large role in deterring migration through the use of force, but through other, other means as well. And the trade-off was, okay, Mexico will do this. The government will help the United States 
pursue its interest in stopping migrants from reaching the border, but you'll leave some of our domestic agenda alone. That is a deal with the devil that should be criticized. There should have been, we, you know, there could have been a different play in that situation to prevent that from happening. That's the decision the president made. It's a decision I disagree with. Um, in terms of, is it happening independently because of the military? That's also, it's a separate but related question. In fact, one of the criticisms coming from some of um, some sectors has been precisely this uh, relationship that the president has with the military. I would say this, which is something that often is not talked about. A lot of people talk about militarization. I think it's a term that is debatable. I do think the border has become militarized. I don't think society has become militarized. I think militarization is a very specific kind of under way of doing things that has more in common with like the dictatorships of in the Southern Cone during the 20th century. Uh, but he does very much use the military. He has given them more powers. He has um, allowed them to take over certain civilian functions. That a lot of analysts will tell you it's um, it's because of the power of the military, and that's part of it. But the other thing is we call it el síndrome de Madero. In the Mexican Revolution, after the ouster of Porfirio Diaz, Francisco Madero takes office, and he's ousted by a right-wing reactionary coup led by Victoriano Huerta. There is a very real threat of a military coup in Mexico. It could happen. And so what Lopez Obrador's strategy was, I'm going to keep the military happy. I'm going to do what they need. And even when it comes to certain human rights abuses historically of kind of looking the other way when they prevent investigators from finding out what's actually in the archives of the armed forces. He's trying to keep them happy in order to prevent a coup from happening. I know that sounds kind of exaggerated, but it's a very real fear. You know, we're here in, in, in uh, IPS, which did a lot of work around the coup in Chile in 73. In Chile, they always talked about like, no, we have a patriotic armed forces. There's never been a coup here. They wouldn't do that. And they did it. And it was the consequences were severe. And so it's a, it's a strategy to try to keep them on his side. And so far it's worked, right? The, mil the armed forces. And also it's worth mentioning, the government inherited a very complicated security situation. One that still has a long way to go in terms of resolving it. And a lot of the tasks of attending to that security situation falls to the armed forces. So again, it's an effort to keep them happy. The strategy of the Mexican government towards the security situation does represent a break from the past. They used to talk about the war against the cartels and all this kind of stuff, very bellicose language. What the government today talks about is, venimos a conquistar la paz. We came to achieve peace. And it talks about, often he's criticized for it, la abrazos no balazos, hugs not bullets. And they kind of you know, say it in kind of a disrespectful way, like, ah, what a stupid strategy. How does he think that's going to work? What it's actually about is about tending to the root causes, about making sure that young people have other opportunities so that they aren't becoming cannon fodder for these armed groups. But also, not that situation won't improve until we get a handle on the drug situation here. Like I said earlier, what this is is actually responding to a demand that's happening across the border, but also all of the weapons that are coming from the United States into Mexico. Those weapons are the ones that make these organized crime groups as powerful as they are, right? That it makes it so that your ordinary police officer with a handgun can't hold a candle to these groups that have that are well armed, that have armored vehicles. It's it's incredible. You know, I live in the capital. We don't really kind of experience that on a day-to-day -day basis, but there are parts of the country, Michoacan, where our brother's from, is in a very complicated situation of that. And if you talk to the population, what they want is security. And so he's also responding to a demand, a very loud demand coming from places. Thank you so much for the very educational presentation. Of, uh, um, so quick question is, what percentage of GNP goes to the military in Mexico? I don't know that off the top of my head. Um, I'd have to look, but it's, it's, it's substantial. I, it pales in comparison to what, what is spending here in the United States. And, you know, I think it was, I think it was Fidel who used to say, you know, every gun that we have to purchase is one less book that we have for education, right? But the, the security situation has to get under control uh, in order for us to be able to be in a position to be able to 
take away some of that funding. But also part of the strategy has been to kind of give independent funding streams to the armed forces. So it's not coming directly from from the coffers. They they now run airports and ports and stuff like that. And that helps kind of keep them funded without spending. But I would agree with you that um, it any amount is probably too high and it should be one of the other challenges in terms of one of the things I would also say um, is she okay? Okay. <laughs> um, yeah. Anyway, go ahead. I lost my train of thought. Next question. <laughs> I thought there was a chair there. <laughs> no, don't worry about it. Right. So uh, if anybody has questions online, please put them in the chat or in the Q and a, my question is, uh, is um thank you for your presentation really yeah. deep and informative uh, I, uh mine is uh gonna have to do with what you mentioned sovereignty and the fact that imperialism is an issue yeah N now it's gonna go to the internationalism of morena and maybe the effects and it has to do with haiti the haiti in mm -hmm. particular because um you know haiti is wrought, fraught with intervention imperialism a crisis of imperialism that's proposed now as the threat of gangs as you know reason um mexico has voted for the u.n yeah. resolution to for an, an foreign intervention in haiti um and 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 from my understanding participates in in training the paramilitary force so what you know if we we're going to talk about a left and celebrating that you know how do we have a uh a leftist movement that does not leave out the black country of Haiti. <laughs> Absolutely. All of Latin America owes a huge debt to Haiti and will always owe debt to Haiti. And I think it's time that we start to pay that back by opposing foreign intervention in Haiti. One would hope that the government would take the right, correct principal position. As you just said, they haven't. And the reason they haven't is because they're also there's a constant process of trying to appease certain people and keep it. It's not, but there are principal positions. And I think when we talk about internationalism, it would be good that if we do get someone like yourself to come down to Mexico, that we hold an event and we talk about why Mexico's position is wrong. And we start to build a movement domestically to put that pressure on to say that, no, we won't tolerate more foreign intervention in Haiti. This is not what they need. They don't need another occupying force in there to get that pressure from below. Well, you know, I would say that one of the places where we have still have a long way to go talking about in comparison to Venezuela, Hugo Chavez was also convinced always of a participatory protagonist democracy, of being really convinced that there has to be an authentic, concrete way for the masses, for the population to intervene directly in national policies. And Mexico, it's still very much a bourgeois democracy, right? It's still a representative democracy. We need to start thinking about how do we build something that starts to challenge some of those notions of bourgeois democracy. If we're, you know, I talked about how the, the government's in a good place, the party's in a confident position. Why shouldn't we go be going further, including questioning some of these pillars of bourgeois democracy involving more participation? And then through that, being able to pressure so that on these issues that they're able to hear the voices of the population that say no. But I think, you know, there's some work for us to do. I think there's frankly not enough knowledge about what's what's being proposed for Haiti so that that vote isn't the way that it's going lately so that we can put that pressure on. I would love that for it to be part of the process that has to be to and fro. I'm not here to ask you to just come and, you know, help us, but hopefully, um, you know, we can go further by learning from the, numerous experiences of people who are who have resisted imperialism and are working against for example you know a, another uh who are working to stop this other occupation force in haiti so we welcome the, i'm with the black line yeah we have the haitian americans and so we welcome that no, no. opportunity absolutely you know maybe some of your policy papers can be translated and we can help distribute those. that's what it's about yeah we should connect and, and so that we can help distribute that. Got it. Right? No. Yes? Oh, boy. It's for the people. No, I understand. Um, my name is Fred Soloway. Right. And my question um, is to ask you to comment on this second story um, and the rights of women. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, in one of the other uh, events, uh, somebody asked about uh, you know, what is the danger of running a female candidate for a country that, yes, 
has a lot of sexism, right? I, I sometimes try to avoid using the term machismo as if it's like a special kind of sexism. <laughs> it is what it is, right? Um, and it needs to be confronted. I think one of the benefits of the fact that there isn't re-election is that it forces us to have to kind of renew the leadership and put someone new. And who's there now? It's Claudia Scheinbaum, who has an excellent track record when it comes to attending to women's issues when she was jefa de gobierno in Mexico City. Uh, obviously, there's still a lot. There is also a very real feminicide crisis in the country uh, that more needs to be done to try to attend to it. But even small things that seem kind of silly that didn't happen before, it took a Morena government to do it. Things like making sure that the public prosecutor's office has somebody who specializes in gender based violence. Mm -hmm. Things like making sure that the major avenues where people walk have enough lighting so that people feel safer. You know, uh, emergency line where that they can call and seek resources. Uh, for example, when often when somebody would denounce violence, gender-based violence, the it was the women who would have to leave the home. And now under law, they get to stay so they can have that stability. And the aggressor is the one who has to leave, right? They sound like small things that seem really obvious, but they hadn't been done. So it just kind of speaks to some of the very concrete things that happened already. And then obviously, Clara Scheinbaum, if you read her profile, she's a really impressive figure. You know, she's uh, well-educated, received her doctorate, expert in, in physics. She was part of the IPCC. She won a Nobel Prize. You know, this is somebody who is really well informed on these issues has been a champion of women's issues as well. And I think also the, and to final, to, as a final point to you, um, fortunately the opposition has chosen a woman as well. So it's a race between two women. And so I was worried that it would affect the public discussion in the country by, you know, saying like, Oh, don't vote for Morena because they're running a woman. Well, that point is moot now. And so now it's going to be a discussion around substantive policy differences between the two. And I think that's really important. And that should allow us to shift the conversation around women's issues to where it needs to be as well. And on final point, you know, in that in that news clip we saw, they talked about so she, she has non-conservative positions, right? Oh, she's pro-gay rights and, and pro-abortion. They asked her recently about abortion because she always would comment, no, I'm in favor of the right to choose. And when they asked her recently, now that she was the opposition candidate, she's like, oh, no, no, I can't say anything because I represent a movement that has a diverse amount of opinions. And therefore, so she's already conceded that point. But that opens up the space for the left party to be actually we're the ones who defend. And we talk about, for example, key women's issues, uh, obviously, one of them being in, in Mexico, uh, access to to um, abortion. It's been it's a state level decision. So it's been decriminalized at the federal level, thanks to a Supreme Court decision. But for it to actually make it into the laws, it has to be approved by local legislatures. It's the Morena led Congresses where there's been the most advancement. And when we started to see the legalization completely of things like abortion. Um, okay, so hi. Sorry for the distraction earlier. <laughs> um, my name is Yesenia Portillo, and uh, I organize with CISPES, the Committee in Solidarity with the People of El Salvador. That's where I knew from. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and yeah, I've learned so much from your comments. So thank you very much um, for being so thorough and um, having so much, you know, very specific information. Um, and, you know, in El Salvador, we had uh, a progressive government for the last, you know, before before the current government, uh, we had two periods of progressive governance that experienced a lot of um, the things that you're talking about with regards to undermining um, by the right wing that was collaborating also with um, the U.S. Embassy. Um, and it kind of led in a lot of ways to what we're dealing with right now in El Salvador with um, a very empty populism, you know, very different from what we have in, in, in Mexico with AMLO. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to kind of say that. Um, and I don't know if you have, is this a good time to share about the compañera being here? Um, well, when, when the questions are done. Okay, okay. Yeah. Um, so once question, once. Yeah. yeah. Oh, it's getting late. Okay. Well, yeah, yeah, okay. we'll come back. We'll come back I, to I, I, do, okay. We should definitely do that. Yeah. Do you want to go now? No, your question first. Yeah, we'll do a question. <laughs> 
Yeah, I just think that it's that we no, should we have to there has to be a question about oil. So I have two. One uh, which is uh, what thinking has there been so far as um, and this is also Venezuela this thing has to think about this countries that have a lot of oil and are very you know hydrocarbon dependent in their economy has there been thinking towards you know getting beyond the the system the, the, you know depending on you know the environment for the environmental reasons and just getting away from fossil fuels and also thinking about Venezuela with the Deer Park, uh, you know, with with expanding the uh, into the US, I mean, Sitco was confiscated. And, you know, it was so is that not making uh, Mexico vulnerable in that same way? So to, to answer your, your first question, yeah, I think um, environmental considerations have to be part of it. But I think it needs to be part of, of the discussion always at an international level. Right. Um, um, unfortunately, what we've seen is that this issue is weaponized to try to attack the government, saying that, oh, he's, a, he's, he's wedded to fossil fuels and all this kind of stuff. Uh, and I don't think the criticism on the surface is inappropriate because we needed to consider what the transition looks like. The problem is, is that, for example, uh, during the previous regime, on the guise of greening the economy, there was an effort to privatize electricity generation. And it wasn't just like, okay, we'll have foreign firms come and build windmill farms and solar farms. It's that they also got sweetheart deals where that were really punitive for the state, where they were like, they were literally the, 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 the National Electricity Commission was forced to buy electricity from these private providers first to make sure that they were being satisfied before using some of the existing infrastructure, right? That's not the way things go. I also think that if we're going to talk about the ecological crisis that is very real, it needs to happen always with a consideration to the ecological debt, right? So we like if any environmental group that's worth its salt has to talk about the fact that there has to be some kind of compensation for global South countries. It's not fair that the industrialized countries got to pollute all they wanted to get rich and now we're the ones who have to stop our production of, of, these, of these resources. So it doesn't have to necessarily be money. I mean, Ecuador tried to do it and nobody ponied up the cash to say, we'll keep the oil in the ground, but you gotta pay us. And nobody, there wasn't enough money, they didn't go for it. Um, but it could be through a transfer of technology, it could be transfer of knowledge. There are different ways to do it. And I think if we're gonna talk about it, if we're serious about doing it, if that's not part of the conversation, then I don't think it, it is actually um, a good faith position coming from it. Uh, and so hopefully we can get there, right? Like, I mean, I don't, I don't think people from the US government have any business telling us about our environmental policies when they opened up more drilling in Alaska, right? So until that changes, I do think that we should, you know, be careful about how we raise that criticism. Uh, but I agree, because I don't want the planet to continue to burn up. Uh, and to the second point, you're right, it is a danger. However, uh, and I'll use this as an opportunity to pitch a book. Uh, the assault against Venezuela has been relentless and some of the most aggressive in the history, in the modern history of Latin America. What they've done, for example, trying to basically break up and steal Sitco is something that is so beyond the pale that, you know, even a few years ago would have been hard to imagine. But it also was hard to imagine that they would pretend some random guy who swore an oath in the middle of a plaza was president. So they're going, we're willing to go really far when it comes to Venezuela because of what Venezuela presents. As much as it's really exciting, everything I told you about Mexico, you know, Venezuela is doing some amazing things with the communes, with the participatory and protagonist democracy, right? They put socialism on the agenda in a way that hadn't been done in a long time. And so I think the, the, the campaign against Venezuela was really severe and it culminates in this sanctions policy that they've been implementing. So I'm gonna do a pitch and then we can close, I think with the comments from, from the sister, yeah? So Venezuela analysis, I write, I'm a staff writer and I do the podcast for Venezuela analysis. You might not recognize it because I lost my voice, but I usually sound better than this. Um, I'll tell you why later. Anyway, uh, we wrote a book. It's called A War Without Bombs. And it is about the social, political and economic impact of sanctions against Venezuela. And this book is basically bringing together new and existing materials that we've published historically uh, on the website, infographics, interviews, all about sanctions. But I think the most exciting thing is also towards the end, there's interviews with people from the communes 
who are being really creative and really amazing efforts to try to resist U.S. imperialism, right? And there's always lessons there. We should never lose hope. Even if imperialism continues to attack Venezuela, if it decides that it wants to go in an all-out attack against Mexico, we have faith in the masses to be able to resist. But anyway, so I invite people, if you have uh, purchased a book, the price is $30 um, because it was a small print. So it's a little bit, it was a little bit expensive to get it. It's a fundraiser for us. Uh, Venezuela Analysis is a reader funded outlet. That's what allows Venezuela Analysis to maintain its independence, like the Mexico Solidarity Project, to point out things that we think need to be criticized. Um, and if, you know, if you're able, we also are asking a solidarity rate of $50. We have a bunch of copies here. Um, you can pay via Venmo, um, or we can figure out cash as well. But yeah, $30 if you're interested in a copy of, of the book that just came out. It's really beautiful too. We had Utopics help us with the editorial design. It's gorgeous. It turned out really, really nice. Look, look at that guy. Who's that? Anyway, thanks so much. And I want to make sure before we wrap up, we give some time here. There's a sister who's joined us from El Salvador um, and talk about her experiences. Maybe we can get her a mic. Um, yeah, thank you so much. So I'm going to just present the compañera that's here visiting. I think one thing. OK. I'll probably interpret for her. Okay. Um, so, um, so yeah, I think one of the things that stood out um, a, a, about a difference, right, between what's happening in El Salvador, obviously very different from what's happening in Mexico, um, but you talked about militarizing, the militarization of the border that's different from like maybe a full militarization of society. And I think in El Salvador, there's definitely many examples of um, the way in which society is being really heavily militarized right now. And so um, the compañera that's joining us today is a land defender. We're really honored to have her here. Um, and she's the coordinator of the um, eh, Movimiento por la Defensa de la Tierra en Tecoluca, which is Movement for Land Defense in Tecoluca, and also coordinator for the um, National Roundtable against um, land displacement and dispossession. Um, and, and yeah, her community is experiencing very direct militarization because of um, standing up against um, the judicial um, uh, persecution uh, that large landowners across El Salvador are currently taking advantage of right now, um, including with the state of exception. So, um, se lo voy a pasar el micrófono y yo le puedo hacer interpretación. Hola, soy Rosa Tobías. Eh, felicidades por la presentación. Muy importante conocer de México y conocerlo de alguien que lo está haciendo muy objetivamente. Eh, bueno, soy del Movimiento por la Defensa de la Tierra y los Recursos Naturales en Tecoluca. Eh, so we we'll, we'll interpret that. So thank you um, for your presentation. It's really important to know what's happening in Mexico, especially um, from somebody who uh, knows the situation well. Um, and good evening. My name is Rosa to Tobias, and I'm from um, the Movement for Land Defense in Tecoluca. In El Salvador, tuvimos por 10 años un gobierno progresista que en medio de todas las adversidades logramos avanzar en relación a a lo que muchos eh, anhelamos en algún momento, sobre todo en el quienes participamos en, en la guerra civil. Um, in El Salvador, we had a period of progressive government governance that we were able to make a lot of advancements that we were fighting for those of us who fought in the civil war. Con este gobierno, con el gobierno, gobierno de Bukele, hemos retrocedido eh, inmensamente en materia de derechos. Eh, Él incluso dice que los acuerdos de paz son una farsa, fueron una farsa, y eso pone en riesgo mucho más la democracia de nuestro país. With this current government, we are um, backtracking immensely, including that the current the current government of Bukele calls the peace accords a farce. Un ejemplo es el caso de la tierra. La tierra fue entregada a producto de los acuerdos de paz a muchos campesinos y campesinas. Y ahora eh, se están generando políticas y leyes que están beneficiando para que los terratenientes vuelvan nuevamente a estar peleando y exigiendo sus tierras. Es decir, una reconcentración de tierras por parte de los terratenientes y dejando a los campesinos y campesinas sin tierra. 
Uh, one of the advancements that were achieved through the peace accords um, was that some lands were given to um, uh, campesinos or peasant communities. Uh, and what is currently happening is uh, that major landowners are coming back after those lands now and they're trying to reconcentrate the lands that um, were given that were that were um, secured through uh, struggle um, during the war. Yo vengo de una comunidad donde 187 familias tenemos orden de desalojo emitida por un juez que ha dado eh, toda nuestra tierra casi a un terrateniente que era el dueño anterior y ha ordenado orden de desalojo para nosotros. Así que estamos esperando que a través de la policía o la fiscalía se nos llegue a sacar de las casas después de casi 33 años de vivir ahí. I come from a community where 180 families have been given uh, an eviction order by the judge um, because uh, the previous owner uh, has, um, you know, has been given, the judge gave that, that previous owner rights to the land. So we're waiting any day now to be 180 families uh, removed from our lands. Uh, we're waiting for the police or military to come or, or expecting that the police and military might come to evict us. Y hay muchas comunidades a nivel nacional que tienen también orden de desalojo porque las tierras están siendo peleadas por personas con renombre, con apellidos como Bukele Simán, el caso de la Normandía, la cooperativa Normandía. En el caso de la comunidad Guajoyo, pues es, son apellidos Molina. En el caso de la isla Tasajera, Ahí también son apellidos Closa, eh, apellido Saca y también los Bukele, que están queriendo dejar sin tierra también a montones de familias que no tienen más que su pedacito donde vivir. And there's many other examples across the country um, of communities that have eviction orders um, because judges are giving um, rights to lands to um, elite and oligarchic families um, with very well-recognized names like Simán Bukele, um, uh, Saka as well. In, in our community, it's um, uh, Molina, um, but also the Closa family, which are you know big oligarchic families um, that are now coming after comunidades like Tasajera, my community, Guajoyo, also the Cooperativa, the Normandia cooperatives. Nos hemos organizado las comunidades y hemos decidido resistir en medio de todas esas adversidades, aunque el precio que estamos pagando ahora es la persecución política por el hecho de estar eh, oponiéndonos a las políticas de este gobierno. Our communities are organizing and we have decided to resist these eviction orders, even though what we're now facing is political persecution because of the resistance. Y un claro ejemplo es eh, mi familia. Yo estoy al frente de la Mesa Nacional contra la expropiación y desalojo de las tierras. Este día mi esposo fue llamado a audiencia, eh, acusado injustamente de algo que no ha hecho y esperábamos este día lo peor, que fuera encarcelado a través de la ley de, 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 de la ley que tenemos ahorita, ¿verdad? Que es tan fácil, la ley de excepción ya lleva 19 meses y es tan fácil eh, detener, capturar a la gente, llevarla a las cárceles. Y esta es una persecución política que estamos viviendo quienes estamos en defensa de los derechos humanos, en defensa de la tierra y en defensa también de los recursos naturales. And one clear example is um, my family. Um, I'm the coordinator of the National Roundtable in defense um, against land expropriation and in defense of the people's land. Um, and this morning, my husband um, was called to a hearing because he's being falsely accused of something that he didn't do. Um, and we were expecting the worst, especially given um, the conditions under the state of exception that we've been under for the last um, 19 months, um, where people's constitutional rights have been suspended um, and the uh, human rights defenders, land defenders, um, community organizers are being persecuted. Y no hay instancia donde acudir porque todas están a la orden del gobierno del presidente Bukele. Hemos ido a la Procuraduría para la Defensa de los Derechos Humanos y lo que se nos ha dicho es que somos valientes al estar contradiciendo las leyes del presidente Bukele y que tengamos cuidado. 
there isn't any government institutions that we can turn to. Um, so we went to the human rights ombudsman and what we were told is that we were very courageous um, for standing up to um, the laws of the government and that we should be careful. Así que aprovechamos para hacer la denuncia pública de la persecución eh, que estamos viviendo líderes, lideresas que estamos en defensa de los derechos humanos, en defensa de la tierra y en defensa de los recursos naturales. No sabemos qué va a pasar con nosotros. Hemos decidido continuar esta lucha sabiendo que nos puede esperar la cárcel o también nos, puede, nos pudiera esperar incluso la muerte, ¿verdad? Porque ahora lo que tenemos en la policía y en la Fuerza Armada son cuerpos represivos. Um, so we, um, you know, I'm taking advantage of this space to um, make the public denouncement of what's happening, um, because right now in El Salvador, human rights defenders, environmental defenders um, are being, land defenders are being persecuted, and we are standing up to this, even though what we face is potential arrest and even death, um, because uh, right now what we have in the police and military are repressive forces. Con el régimen de excepción, incluso los militares están violando niñas. Son las últimas noticias que hemos tenido y son las que se atreven a denunciar y son las que las comunidades se organizan también para denunciar. Um, with the state of exception, we're also seeing an increase of um, a sexual assault on young girls. Those are the recent, you know, news that have come out. And these are just some of the people who have the courage to denounce and are able to denounce um, because they're, they have, they come from organized communities most of the time. Muchas gracias por la oportunidad. Thank you. That's all about the, the land being uh, of the people. So, but that the other one is um, oh yeah no no yeah is that good so so does everybody have this so you can sing along yeah. Well, so we hope everybody will sing and say, uh, so if quieres venir, anyway, anyway, so, el pueblo unido jamás será vencido, the people united will never be defeated. Y cantar que vamos a triunfar, levanta ya banderas de unidad y tú vendrás marchando junto a mí y así verás tu canto y tu bandera florecer, la luz y un rojo amanecer, la luz y allá. Vida que vendrá de pie, luchar, el pueblo va a triunfar. Será mejor la vida que vendrá a conquistar nuestra felicidad y en un clamor mil voces de combate se alzarán. Mirar canción de libertad. Vencerá. Y ahora el pueblo que se alza en la lucha con voz de gigante gritando adelante. El pueblo unido jamás será vencido. The people united will never be defeated. La paz está forjando la unidad. De norte a sur se movilizará desde el sol ardiente y mi 